Introduction. I once knew a guy who killed someone, but not in the way you're thinking. Back in 2014, my friend David was on a standard airport run to meet another friend, Sarah, who was returning to the States after spending a year studying in Europe. He picked her up and dropped her off at her parents' home at around 2 o'clock in the morning. He then took the freeway home. While cruising down the empty road, his life changed in an instant. Without warning, a hooded man ran in front of his car. Of course, being about 3 a.m. and pitch black except for the car headlights, there was zero time to react. The car slammed into the man, and David screamed out curses louder than he'd ever had in his life. He pulled over to the side, turned on the hazard lights, and instantly grabbed his phone to call the police. They arrived in minutes. After spending hours and hours on high alert, waiting for the police to conduct their investigation, including taking statements and administering alcohol and drug tests, his tests ultimately came back clean. The man David hit was pronounced dead at the scene. After four hours, the freeway cleared and the police gave David a lift home. At seven in the morning, David walked into his home with two police officers in tow. His worried girlfriend came downstairs to greet him as he'd been incredibly late and hadn't been answering calls. At the sight of the officers, her panic escalated. Shocked and finally coming down from the adrenaline rush, David sat down and allowed the officers to inform his girlfriend what had happened and detailed the next course of action. Tired, shocked, and panicked, David's girlfriend fainted, collapsing onto the tiled floor without warning. She hit her head hard, and as she bled from the wound, one of the officers called for an ambulance. David proceeded to spend another six hours in the emergency room as doctors ran tests on his girlfriend before concluding she'd basically had a massive panic attack. The events of the night had been overwhelming for her. When they finally made their way back home, David slept for two days before experiencing his first ever panic attack the moment he woke up, a feeling that convinced him, to this day, that he'd rather die. The investigation was closed a few months later, and David faced no charges. Investigators discovered that the guy who'd run into the road had been severely depressed and addicted to drugs and alcohol. Texts and phone calls from that night revealed that his girlfriend had broken up with him, and while he may not have wanted to die, his blood alcohol content was miles past the legal limit. David felt fine for a while, telling us that he'd had so many epiphanies from that night. For the first time, he saw that life was precious, and that anything could happen when you least expect it. He was grateful for his instincts for controlling the car and safely pulling over to the side of the road. If he'd panicked or lost control, he could have easily lost his life that night. He was grateful he'd survived, but gutted that the man's loved ones had lost a brother, a son, and a friend. However, three years later, David sunk into a deep depression. Gradually, he started spending less time with family and friends. He broke up with his girlfriend shortly after she moved away, and David quickly found himself in a toxic, controlling relationship. He drastically lost weight, stopped going to the gym, and frequently sat in the local park in the rain, staring into the distance, seemingly disconnected from the world around him. I would sit with him on these benches sometimes, and we'd talk about television shows or the news. I would tell him what our friends were up to, or just talk about a movie I'd seen. He rarely spoke. He mostly stared at the ground when I was with him. One time, however, something changed. He turned to me, gripped my jacket as the rain poured, and stared me dead in the eyes. His words chilled me. I'm so scared, Layla. I'm scared I'm going to do something. I'm scared I'm going to hurt myself. I don't want to die, but there's a part of me that wants to. It's getting stronger. I didn't reply. I pulled him into my arms and held him tight. He burst into tears. We cried together. David tells me that conversation was a turning point in his life. He became proactive, 
he started developing new habits, saw a professional therapist, and slowly made it to the other side. There's no denying he's come so far, and I can happily say that his suicidal thoughts stopped. He's starting to really enjoy his life again as a happy and healthy individual. That day was also a turning point in my life. Already deep into my self-development journey, I started to realize that there's a powerful and overwhelming power in our lives, yet most of the time, we're unaware of its presence. I think for many of us, we're so used to this power being present and relentless that we don't know what it's like to live without it. Of course, I'm talking about the voice in our heads. David's was an extreme case. Having gone through such a traumatic and impactful experience, the voice in his head was louder than ever before, basically shouting and screaming so loudly that he could hear nothing else. It became all-consuming, and why he felt so lost and depressed. Yet this voice exists in all of us. The voice that tells you that you can't do something, so you don't. The voice that tells you a person doesn't like you, you said the wrong thing, you made a mistake, and now everybody hates you. The voice that declares that you're lonely, worthless, stressed, broke, stupid, not good enough, too fat or too thin, not pretty or handsome, or not successful enough. The voice that goes on and on and on and never shuts up. And when you listen, you're devastated. When you don't, you still know deep down it's there in the shadows and you're waiting for it to come back again. You feel it. Overthinking is running rampant in our modern day society. It's a pandemic that's been growing for decades, becoming more and more common, creating more of an impact than ever before. Rates of anxiety and depression are higher than ever before. Suicide rates are still growing year by year. It's the second leading cause of death of people aged 10 to 34. And more people agree that they aren't happy with the lives they are living. A 2016 study found that only 31% of Americans say they are happy. Comparatively, one in five American adults will experience a mental health problem each year, one in 20 of those serious. And with 50% of all lifetime mental illnesses beginning at the age of 14, 75% by the age of 24, this is something that needs to be addressed. The voice in our heads bombards us every single day from the moment we're awake until the moment we fall asleep. And sometimes it keeps us awake. I'm not talking about overthinking as a mental health problem. Have you ever wanted to write a book, start a business, have the friends you want, follow your dream, have healthy and happy relationships, live the life you want to live? Chances are you already know how the voice in your head is making you unhappy. It's the reason you were drawn to this book. You know your reasons. And now it's time to take action. Before we continue, I want you to write down your reason for picking up this book. Whatever it is, write it down on a piece of paper right now and keep it beside you. Whatever anxious feelings or overthinking thoughts you have and how they are stopping you from being who you want to be, write it down. You may be wondering why I told you David's story. It's a dark tale, but it's one with a light at the end of the tunnel. David was in a dark place. And I'm sure you know or have heard of someone in a similar position. People like David, like myself, and everyone who go on this journey are living, breathing proof that you don't need to live in a world where the voice in your head is in control. There are solutions. There are remedies. There are ways you can take back control of your life and keep yourself in check. And guess what? There are ways and things you can do that will help you achieve genuine happiness in your life. This is what we'll cover in this book. 27 Ways to Stop Overthinking, to Calm the Voice and the Relentless Thoughts, to Stop Worrying About Things, and to Stop Feeling So Stressed. 27 Ways to Stay Calm, 
find peace, and be happy. So, take that piece of paper that you wrote the way that your internal voice is holding you back, tear it into tiny pieces, or screw it up into a ball, and throw it in the bin. Today's the day the change starts, and your journey begins. I'm ready when you are. How to use this book. While there's no right or wrong way to use and learn from this book, I want to take time to remind you that this book doesn't need to be read linearly. To keep things easy, I've broken down the book into five easy chapters covering the following. Chapter one is about understanding the problem. It's about figuring out why you overthink and how you got to where you are today. Once we understand the problem, we can work out how to fix it and how to make things better. Chapter 2 is about dealing with stress. We all feel stress, whether it's caused by our overthinking or our stress leads to overthinking. When the voice makes itself heard, anxiety strikes. Or if a situation isn't going your way, stress ensues, and if you don't know how to deal with it, it's going to take over. I will show you how to stop that from happening. Chapter 3 is about dealing with anxiety. I like to think of anxiety as long-term stress. Technically, they are different. We'll go into this later. But I think of stress as being an in-the-moment state of mind, whereas anxiety is how you're affected long-term by life and your own thoughts. It takes different strategies to cope with this way of living. Chapter 4 dives into the ways you can deal with overthinking in the moment. Whether you've just started thinking about something or you're dealing with your habitual thinking patterns and self-talk. How you talk to yourself is everything in this world. And this chapter is about taking control from the uncontrollable. It's about truly grasping and becoming you. Finally, we move on to Chapter 5, which is where we change course, moving away from dealing with problems and instead basking in the joys of the solutions. Chapter 5 is about physically rewiring your brain for happiness and learning the techniques and methods that will help you genuinely open the doors to living the life you want. The methods detailed in the following chapters are based on psychology and science, and I'll link studies and references along the way. Basically, these are strategies that have been proven to work and deliver results. You just need to build the habits and implement them. When I say this, I mean choosing what works for you. While there are methods in these pages that won't resonate with you and you may not think will work, many more methods will change your life. Read this book however you want. If you see a method here that speaks to you and you want to find out more, then jump to that chapter and find out about it. However, I highly recommend reading the book once through first, taking in all the information you can about each method, and then deciding how you want to proceed. You may be pleasantly surprised with some methods, and you may find a solution you never thought of. Nevertheless, the most important thing to remember is that you're here to figure out what works best for you as an individual and only you can do that. This book exists to provide you with options and knowledge to help you make an informed decision, the best for you. Okay, I think that's enough talking for now. Let's begin this journey. Chapter 1. Finding Your Foundations Back when my overthinking and the state of my mental health were at their worst, I felt trapped and lost. Believing these feelings were going to last forever. At least, that's what the voice was telling me. When you're not feeling okay, whether you're feeling mildly anxious, a bit panicky, or downright depressed, it's a strange phenomenon that we feel as though this is how our life will be from here on out. Negative feelings tend to be all-consuming, meaning that you can't seem to see past them. Rational thought seems to disappear. And the more you overthink and go down the rabbit hole, the harder it seems to get out of it. There's a lot of talk claiming it's okay not to be okay. And while that's true, 
and everybody will certainly find themselves in dark places from time to time. It's important to remember that it's not okay to not be okay forever, and this will never be the case. This book's main focus is on the concept of overthinking. This can be a standalone condition where if you're feeling stressed or going through something, you overthink. It can just happen, sometimes randomly, and minutes or hours can pass and you suddenly realize that your mind has been racing at a million thoughts a minute, preventing you from being happy in the moment. Overthinking is also a symptom of mental health conditions like anxiety and depression. It's important to reiterate that this book will not help you overcome these conditions. Psychological conditions can vary dramatically in their nature and impact, sometimes based on life's circumstances and sometimes being a biological condition that requires medical help and treatment. Overthinking is a severe part of that. So while you'll need to address those issues separately, I do hope this book can help you on your path to recovery and stepping forward into a better, happier, more peacefully content life that you truly deserve, a life we all truly deserve. It all starts with figuring out where you are on your own personal journey and working from there. Figuring out where you are and what's going on with you I remember when I was told the same thing, and I couldn't think of anything worse than diving into my own problems and life situation. Does anyone really want to take a long look into that mirror? Probably not. However, it's the first and most important step in every journey. It's the process of positioning yourself on your map so you can plot your route. And of course, no one can tell you where you are because your life situation is your own, and nobody else knows you as you do. That being said, this chapter will help you find out where you're standing. So let's dive into it. Why do we overthink? There are multiple reasons why you overthink. The most common is believing that there's something wrong with you. Hear me out, just because you overthink, doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. Overthinking is usually a symptom created from the long-term buildup of things happening in your life that has led you to where you mentally are right now. Chances are you've not been an overthinker your entire life, but it is rather a process that has gradually become more and more prominent to you. Think of it this way. Let's imagine you were in a relationship with someone during your school or college years. You really liked this person, and you might even go as far as to say they were your first love or your childhood sweetheart. Everything was amazing, and you were happy. However, you found out your partner cheated on you, and you broke up and never spoke again. During your grieving period, where you're effectively mourning the loss of your relationship, you think about what you did wrong. How could you have been better? What could you have done different to stop them from going off with someone else? Did you push them away? Let's face it, teenagers and young adults are never great at communication since this is the stage where we're all still learning how to do it properly, and chances are you're never going to get any answers. Time passes, and you move on. You end up in another relationship, and you're happy. However, because of your past experiences, you start to think about what you could do differently and how you can make the other person happier because you don't want them to cheat on you. You start feeling anxious when they go out and see other people because you're scared of being cheated on. You imagine what the other person is doing and other dreadful fantasies. You prepare yourself to hear the news of them cheating on you as though that's going to soften the blow when it happens. Since you're not your genuine self, but rather are acting on emotions arising from your incessant overthinking, the relationship breaks down. Because of this, your overthinking goes into overdrive. What did you do wrong? What could you do better? Is it you? Were they the one? Will you ever find happiness? Thus, the overthinking becomes worse. This process continuously snowballs throughout your life, 
in all areas of your life until the problems are addressed. But you're not going to be able to address the problems if you can't deal with the overthinking in the first place, which is precisely what this book is about and aims to teach you how to do. Another quick example. If you're working a job you hate, but you get fired or leave, and you end up going through similar experiences with multiple jobs, then you start overthinking when it comes to working and managing your career. This causes a degree of overthinking, which will typically cause more problems and thus more overthinking. It's a continuous, self-sustaining cycle. So yes, when asking what has caused your overthinking, it could be coming from you. Not you as a person, but rather the series of events and experiences you've been a part of throughout your life. By learning the methods throughout this book, you should be able to break the cycle of overthinking so you can address the problems at their core. Some other issues you may be experiencing in your life that can lead to overthinking include poor confidence or self-esteem, not believing in yourself or trusting your instincts, you are protective of yourself or others, perfectionism, habitual thinking patterns. There are other external factors that trigger overthinking. The best and most recent example is the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, a prominent and global event that received immense coverage on the internet and on the news, usually 24 hours a day. With so much information about the death and destruction it's causing, how could you not overthink the pandemic? Such an event causes panic and anxiety on a mass scale. Personally, I wasn't really worried about the pandemic. I knew people who got it and were ill, and I also knew several people who died from it. I tend to believe that when it's time to go, it's time. And while it's a tragedy for such a horrible situation to be our reality, I try to come to peace with it as much as possible. However, when you're in bed at night and you get a slight cough, you feel like you should be able to smell something, but you can't, or you're feeling just slightly off. Of course, after so much news and media coverage, you're going to think, oh my God, I've caught it, and now I'm going to be ill, and I could even die. If you let these thoughts continue unchecked, that's a serious rabbit hole you'll fall into. With that, it's easy to see that external factors can play a huge role when it comes to the reason why you overthink. 